In ancient times, if you slaughtered a cow or bought some meat, what did you do if you didn't have a fridge? <laughs> We're going to find out in this video. We're also going to find out what an uglitude is. You've never heard that word before because I made it up. <laughs> and Jesus said that we had to be more righteous than the Pharisees or we wouldn't get into heaven. How exactly do we do that? Well, we're continuing in the Sermon of the Mount. We're going to read and then we'll explain those things. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, with what will it be salted? It is then good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do you light a lamp and put it under a measuring basket, but on a stand. And it shines to all who are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For most certainly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever shall break one of these least commandments and teach others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, there is no way you will enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the ancient ones, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, will be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of Gehenna. If therefore you are offering your guilt at the altar, and there remember that your brother has anything against you, leave your gift at the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are with him on the way, lest perhaps the prosecutor deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be cast into prison. Most certainly I tell you, you shall by no means get out of there until you have paid every last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that everyone who gazes at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away from you. For it is more profitable for you than one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away from you. For it is more profitable for you than one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna. He was also said, Whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I tell you that whoever puts away his wife, except for the situation of sexual immorality, makes her an adulteress. And whoever marries her when she is put away commits adultery. All right. So we're in the most famous sermon of all time. Jesus is way up near the Lake Galilee and he's preaching a sermon on the Mount and we already covered the eight beautiful attitudes yesterday and now he starts saying strange things about salt. <laughs> he says that you are the salt of the earth. He's the only person who's ever called me salt or you salt. This is what they did with meat in ancient times because they didn't have a fridge. If you wanted your meat to last a long time, you'd salt it down. And so you get your salt, you rub it in, and then the salt kills the germs, keeps the germs away, and the meat causes, it to, it causes the meat to last a long time. You know, even in um, more recent times with explorers sailing the oceans, they would have salted meat. So it's, you know, was a common thing before refrigeration. But what happens if you... Um, what happens if you uh, mix the salt with sand? <laughs> uh, let's say, uh, you know, you're a, 
you're you're the salt seller, you know, the salt merchant, and you uh, you don't quite have enough salt to sell, so you get a bit of sand from the beach and you mix it through the batch. So it's not qu- quite as salty as before. <laughs> well, it's you know, it it's there comes a point when the salt isn't all that salty and it's useless. It literally is no good except to be thrown out and trampled on, which is what Jesus said. What if the salt has lost its flavor? Like, what if it isn't salty anymore? It's useless. And uh, But salt itself is a... Today, we think it makes things taste good. It does, but it, it was a preservative. And so Christians, if you're a Christian and you follow God, you are like salt because you act as a preservative in the world around you. You know, in the Old Testament, there's this story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God wants to, like, destroy these two cities. But Abraham is, like, having a whole discussion with the Lord. This is back in Genesis 22, 23, around there. You can go watch our videos. And um, Abraham's saying to God, what if there's just, you know, 50 good people? Uh, Will you still destroy it? And God says, no, I'll spare it. What if 40? Mm, Okay. So Abraham is bartering with the Lord, trying to save the city, And he stops bartering when he gets down to 10 good people. The city didn't have 10 good people, so it was destroyed. But in that we learn that even 10 righteous people would have preserved the city. So those 10 people were like salt. Now, how is it that that you could have a city that's so crazy, but a few good people can preserve it? Why exactly is that the case? I think it's the case because those people are giving an example of what goodness is and God is so kind and merciful that um, he wants everyone to observe what's the right thing and have a chance to be saved. But when a city like Sodom has all of its goodness removed, there's nothing left, there's no way it can be saved, the city itself now, there's nothing redeeming about it at all it needs to be destroyed. It needs to be removed so that it won't cause, you know, it won't cause any harm. And so even one good person, you know, say you're, say you're the only Christian in your school or you're the only Christian in your workplace, you're salt. And Jesus says, um, don't lose your flavor. Be the salt you're supposed to be. And we know from the very next verse, because he says, you're the light. And, you know, don't hide your light. Let people see your light. And he tells you what the light is in verse 16. Let your light shine before men or people that they may see your good works. The good things you do is your light and your salt. And you need to do them. Jesus said to do them. Christians love to hide their good deeds. (laughs) Or maybe not even do them. And, uh, you know, in World War II, you know, bombers were flying over and they were looking for cities to drop their bombs on and all the people you know in world war ii would cover up their windows and then they wouldn't turn on lights but they'd have candles so the light was really low but the windows were covered up so the bombers wouldn't know where to drop their bombs and um so they were trying to cover up so no one would know where they were well see that's what christians do <laughs> they try to cover up don't tell anyone i'm a christian you know something bad might happen well actually no something good might happen someone might find the Lord. Remember one of the beautiful attitudes was being willing to suffer for righteousness. You know, one of the beautiful attitudes is being a peacemaker, wanting to see others reconciled to God. So Jesus is saying, have these beautiful attitudes, but, and don't hide your light. Let people see those attitudes. So if you're the only Christian in your workplace, May the Lord give you courage to be a Christian the way he wants you to be. Now, Jesus said that he did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Some people, the whole question of the law, which is like the Old Testament laws, and the New Testament, which is full of what seems like grace and kindness, some people think they don't mix, but they mix very well. (laughs) And I probably don't have time to go into it, but when we get to the book of Romans, I'll go into it. And explain it really well but basically you don't have grace unless you've got law so you know you imagine a a um let's say a tyrant teacher that's always slapping his students 
And then one day a student is caught doing the wrong thing and the teacher is so angry and the student says, please, please, don't do that. And the teacher says, okay, I'll give you a second chance. It's kind because the punishment and the law or because of all the circumstances, the context of you've done the wrong thing and now you're going to be punished because that's there, the kindness is kind. But if you're in a school where there's never any discipline, where teachers never ever punish anyone and they do the wrong thing, they're like, huh, what are you going to do to me? If the teacher says, I'll be kind and I'll let you off, it's like it literally becomes no big deal at all. So the grace of the Lord needs the law. You can't have grace without law, but law needs grace because otherwise everyone's doomed and that's all there is. They need each other. And the Lord in his wisdom gives both. <laughs> and the Lord comes not to make us all fulfill the law. He comes to fulfill the law for us. So yes. And then he says, we have to be more righteous than the Pharisees or we won't even get into heaven. How exactly do we become more righteous than Pharisees? We do it by placing ourselves in Jesus Jesus fulfills the law. He becomes more righteous than the Pharisees. We put our faith in Jesus and we follow him. And by doing so, we are more righteous than the Pharisees, not because of our own works, but because of Christ's works. It's a great sermon, this Sermon on the Mount. Every part of it is wonderful. And then he goes on to talk about what I call, I've just labeled the uglitudes. <laughs> and... Um, you know, earlier in the chapter, we yesterday's video, we talked about the beatitude, the beautiful attitudes. But now Jesus is going to talk about some ugly attitudes. <laughs> They're not called the ugly attitudes by anyone else in the world as far as I know. But I just thought of this name up because he's going to describe the first one as hatred. You remember one of the beatitudes was kindness. But here now he's going to talk about hatred. And he says, you have heard it said... Whoever murders, you know, will get punished. But I say, even if you hate someone, you'll be punished. So Jesus is saying that hatred is the same as murder. See, he, that's an ugly attitude, hatred. It's the complete opposite of the Beatitudes. And in the beautiful attitudes, Jesus said, if you've got these attitudes, you'll be happy. Well, I can tell you for certain, if you have got the ugly attitudes, you will be not only unhappy, miserable and anyone who's full of hate is miserable you punish yourself and um, because when you have these attitudes you tie your own feelings to what other people are doing instead of tying your feelings to Christ when you tie your feelings to Christ you will find happiness no matter what happens because Christ has done the perfect thing <laughs> but when you tie your feelings to what other people do they will never do the perfect thing and you will always be miserable so, is hatred the same as murder? Yes. And I'll explain how that is the case in just a minute when we get to the second uglitude. Jesus says, you, shall not, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery. So, this is an attitude of lust, or... I, I summarized it as coveting. It's wanting things that are not yours or that you can't get or you shouldn't get or are not right for you to get. This whole attitude of trying to have things that you're not supposed to have, um, it's, it's almost a type of stealing. Now, you might say, well, you know, if you're lusting after someone, you're not actually doing anything wrong. Like You're not actually committing adultery. You're not actually stealing someone's wife. How could it be that bad? And see, a lot of people have really struggled at this point. How, where it really clicked for me in understanding it, because some people have said, oh, Jesus is just, you know, making it, you know, he, he's just trying to make it really clear what's right and wrong. You know, Jesus is just saying, you know, he's making the standard tougher just to really make sure no one commits adultery. So someone said it was like that, but it's not like that. Lusting actually is the sin of adultery and and. When you go through this little quick thought experiment with me, it, it should, I hope, make complete sense. And this clicked for me when I was reading St. Augustine. He wrote a book, a very, very famous book, called The City of God. I haven't read it all yet, but I've read a, a chunk of it. 
And uh, this was a few years ago. I was reading book one, and I got up to chapter 16, and it was, it was t- talking about these Christian single women who were virgins, but they were raped by... Uh, soldiers so soldiers that you know came into the city of rome or different places and they raped these women and um these women you know were violated and the wrong thing was done by them but they were christian women and they had such a guilty conscience because they thought they had committed adultery they thought because they had participated in this physical act that they had sinned against God and were guilty of adultery. Some of them thought they were even going to go to hell. And Augustine was trying to explain to them, you, you haven't sinned because you didn't choose to do that. Like, he was trying to say, this was not something you wanted. Someone else wanted it, yes. And you physically participated in it against your will, but the point is it's against your will You didn't want to do that. So he says, because you didn't want to do that, you didn't sin. You know, your body may have physically done the act, but you did not commit adultery. And therefore, according to St. Augustine, you're still a virgin. You're still a virgin, said St. Augustine, because you did not commit adultery. Well, you know, we can all accept that. It's great logic. But what if you wanted to, but you didn't physically do it? Well, that's what Jesus is saying. The desire for the thing is the thing. The the sin is the desire. The desire itself, in other words, the desire to do something wrong is wanting to do something wrong. So the desire to do something wrong is the sin. Anyway, it's, it's a bit of a thought process. Once you realize that lusting for someone, you know, you want to be with someone's wife or you, if you're a lady, you're wanting to be with someone's husband, that desire, that's the same as the sin. Because, you know, you imagine that all of a sudden you've got like a, a button. Poof, you can do anything you want and just press the button and like everything goes back to like before and no one knows. Would you do it? Well, a lot of people would. So what's really stopping them isn't isn't that they want to do what's right it's just the consequences they don't want to get caught they don't want to cause any problems they don't don't want to get into trouble with the lady's husband or whatever and in the same way as that the hatred is the sin of murder because it's hatred is the desire to harm someone else and often hatred isn't carried out because fear of consequences or fear of something else so jesus is really on the money and so in the last chapter, we went through these eight beautiful attitudes, the, be- the Beatitudes, but now Jesus starts talking about these ugly attitudes, and he's, hatred is one of them. Lust or coveting, you know, wanting things that are not yours is another. And then finally, he talks about uh, a man who leaves his wife and goes and get, marries someone else, who this man is unfaithful. In other words, he's not loyal to their friends, not loyal to their wife not loyal to their family. And um, that is also a very ugly attitude. So Jesus mentions these three. And um, we, we need to get these things out of our lives. Now, sometimes you can try really, really hard to get rid of something that's bad, but it's easier to just get the Lord to come inside. <laughs> and um, if, if you've struggled with a sin that you just can't get rid of, you're going to need the Lord's help because the, the fact is you cannot get rid of it on your own. It's not possible. You can only overcome sin if he helps you. So we're going to pray for that right now. Lord, I ask that you would take away from us all ugly attitudes. Lord, hatred. Lord, covetousness. And Lord, unfaithfulness of all types. Lord, even unfaithfulness at work and Lord, there's a lot of other ugly attitudes. And, but Lord, people, we all have, you know, people have struggled with addictions and temptations and all sorts of things. We've all been through it. Lord, forgive. And I pray now that grace be given. In Jesus' name, amen.